We have just a couple more folks connecting right now to the sound and we'll get started. Amy, can I turn over the waiting room attention to you and I'll make the introductions. Absolutely. Uh, welcome everyone. We'll begin recording now. We have enabled the live transcript for closed captioning. If that's helpful for you, you may find that on the control bar that usually appears at the bottom of your Zoom screen. That will put live subtitles captions there for you um, in the language that's being spoken. Uh, in this case, we'll be working entirely in English today. Um, our warmest welcome to this ASLI workshop on public writing and civic engagement. I'm Laura Barbus Roden, Professor of Modern Languages at Wofford College, and I'm proud to be with Bethany Wigan, the co-president of ASLI. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this live event, the second in a series of ASLI events that Bethany and I, with members of ASLI's executive committee, have envisioned and designed to foster, support, and sustain ASLI members' advocacy and publicly engaged work. Building our collective capacity to work with diverse public audiences for environmental justice and inclusive climate action is an urgent imperative. Thank you all so much for being here and for being part of that work. As we get started, I also want to extend thanks to the Penn Program for Environmental Humanities for co-sponsorship of this event and for exceptional and inspiring work in public engagement. Special thanks to Angela Ferranda of the PPEH, as well as to Amy McIntyre, ASLI's amazing managing director. Amy will staff the controls and waiting rooms. So if you're dropped, feel free to rejoin us and she'll let you in. By way of logistical information, we'll ask that you remain on mute. Our speaker will take questions at the end. I'll be helping to facilitate and we'll ask that you use the chat or the raised hand function on your reactions button to indicate that you have a question. Please try to keep your questions concise since we have only brief minutes together. And now it's my great good fortune to introduce our facilitator today, Dr. Anthony Leoy, who will share his expertise on important actions for inclusive environmental futures, a letters to the editor project for immigrant rights and anti-ICE activism. As the climate emergency affects many already made vulnerable in places like Central America, where half a million people were displaced just months ago by two of 2020's most powerful hurricanes, justice for immigrants and refugees worldwide is an important issue for climate justice. And the letter to the editor, the topic about which Ant will speak, is a genre accessible to many of us for shaping public opinion and political action. Anthony is Professor of Liberal Arts and English at the Juilliard School in New York, and he is the author of the book, Nerd Ecology, Defending the World with Unpopular Culture. His areas of expertise include eco-criticism, contemporary American literature, cultural studies, and rhetoric and composition. He has served Asley in many capacities, including co-president in 2016, 2017. He also previously served as an executive counselor from 2011 to 2013, and he's now co-chair of our activism committee and has authored or contributed to many public statements Asley has issued in recent years. Thank you very much, Ant, for that work. I'll turn the program over to you with deep appreciation to you for elevating such important advocacy work for our community. Uh, thank you, Laura. Can, can everyone hear me? I'm coming through, excellent. Um, so uh, I just have a couple of thanks myself before we begin. Um, thank you again to Laura for that generous introduction and to Amy for, uh, for everything <laughs> as usual, um, being the person who makes everything happen. Uh, and again, to the Penn Program in Environmental Humanities uh, for giving us this framework for discussion. Uh, so uh, as Laura said, we, we only have really a very limited time to talk. So I am going to endeavor uh, to, to begin with an explanation of the kind of public writing that I have done uh, with uh, the letter to the editor form and a brief explanation of that form itself. Uh, and then we are going to, uh, we're gonna break up into, uh, into breakout rooms and spend about 15 minutes uh, brainstorming what we would like to do uh, with the letter to the editor, brainstorming and 
uh, and generating questions, right? And then we'll spend the rest of the time uh, in discussion, right? So, uh, so I will just briefly share that agenda so everybody can see it. Let's see if I, there we go. Um, so so uh, I'm gonna start out talking about what are we doing and how are we doing it? Uh, speaking specifically about the letter to the editor uh, as a vehicle for targeted local action. And I wanna explain uh, the context of that. Uh, and then I'm gonna tell you uh, the story of the letter writing campaign where I learned about how to do this uh, and how letter writing really can be an effective political tool. And then we'll talk about the structure of the letter, which is actually fairly simple, but very strict um, in ways that I actually find kind of difficult as a writer because I'm a blah, blah, blah person. I don't, I don't like 200 word limits, but there we are, we'll talk about that. And then we'll do the breakout room uh, and then we'll do discussion and Q and A. So, uh, and eventually I will share with you these breakout room questions, <clears throat> which I will copy now for later use. Okay, so here we go, unsharing. Uh, all right, so let me explain what the letter to the editor is, right, in, in its Anglo-American context, uh, how, it, how it is generally used, and the contrast between the way it is generally used and the way I have used it. Um, so, the letter to the editor, as most of you probably know, is, uh, is a form that is a traditional print form. Uh, and, and in print, it has a long history. Uh, but of course, nowadays, you know, when a lot of newspapers do most of their business online, uh, the letter to the editor has, has gained a new life with social media. Because of course, uh, you send the letter to, uh, to a newspaper that might actually uh, you know, be primarily in print, and maybe it's it it does or does not have, depending on how local it is, uh, it does or does not have uh, uh, a website. But if it does, then when you when you get your letter printed, uh, you can distribute it on on social media, right? You can push it with social media. So this is an interesting example from a historical point of view of an old form that is gaining new legs. Uh, politically speaking, because of social media. So what does the letter to the editor do? And this is, this is actually the beginning of the hard part. The letter to the editor uh, identifies a problem that the writer wants to bring to the attention of the community. Uh, and, and then as we'll see when we look at an example that actually got published, uh, you know, it defines the problem. It gives some basic information about the problem, including uh, you know, appropriate data if, if data uh, are appropriate. Uh, and then it, it tries to make the issue personal, right, both uh, from the perspective of the letter writer and the perspective of the community. And then it usually ends in a demand, right? And so, so the idea of the letter to the editor uh, is that it is an action-oriented genre. It is not really a genre that is designed merely to blow off steam. And if you are merely blowing off steam, the likelihood is that the editors will not choose to publish your letter, right? So, um, so when I describe the, uh, the rules of the genre, I'm actually talking about the, the kind of uh, rules that produce a letter that will be published, right? Because of course, since this is an engagement uh, uh, seminar, right? Uh, and a, a discussion about political engagement in writing, we want to make sure that what we write actually stands a chance of being published. So the first major issue, right, to keep in mind is that uh, you can blow off steam if you want to, uh, but you know if you follow the rules, including the word limitations, which vary from paper to paper, um, you know you will learn, uh, you know, through practice what gets published and what doesn't. But if you follow the rules, you'll have a much better initial chance of being published. So why why bother with the letter to the editor if it is not uh, if it is not just a blowing off steam genre, right? Uh, the experience that I had, where I started out as a skeptic actually of this kind of form, uh, the experience I had was uh, in joining a group uh, in northern New Jersey where I live, uh, in northern New Jersey, USA. Uh, I, I joined a group 
that was working on uh, immigrant rights in general, and in particular, uh, the conditions of ICE detainees uh, in a local correctional facility. Uh, and, and I need to explain some of the details to explain why the letter to the editor campaign actually worked. So letters to the editor uh, in, th in this kind of campaign, right, uh, where we actually got results, uh, it involved a, a very specific strategy, right, of targeting a problem that was local enough, right, that we could draw attention to it being local people. All right, so the problem of ICE detainees in the, the Newark, New Jersey correctional facility, uh, you know, there were many problems, as you probably understand already. Uh, but the thing that we were trying to do, like the, the direct goal, and it's important to have a direct goal in order to figure out what you're writing about, the direct goal was to get independent oversight on the treatment of ICE detainees uh, you know, in this local, uh, this local jail that I live about 20, 20 minutes away from, uh, that was controlled by our county and therefore controlled by a group of politicians that used to be called freeholders and are now called commissioners. Uh, you know, and so the strategy of the letter, of, letter to the editor as a genre that a group was writing together, uh, you know, is that we are trying to attract uh, local attention not even from the politicians themselves that, that controlled the situation, in this case, the county commissioners, uh, but, but actually from their staff, right, who are always monitoring social media and newspapers and other communications media uh, to take the temperature of the constituents, right? So the function of the letter to the editor in this context, right, was to constantly keep in front of the staff of the politicians who were in control of the problem, right? The fact that we were angry, right? And that people who voted were concerned, right? About, uh, about the fact that this injustice was happening and that we had very definite ideas about what should happen. Uh, that first there should be uh, an independent uh, committee, uh, you know, that did oversight, right? That, that was not under the control of the commissioners. And then finally that uh, that the ICE detainees, right, should be released and that no more detainees should be held in that jail, right? So there were a series of bigger and bigger asks. Uh, and, and the reason that the letter to the editor was an effective uh, tool in the end is precisely because we focused on, uh, on our own county, on the politicians that we were actually voting for, right, and, and basically tried to shame them into into doing something and it worked. And I wanna say that the other thing that's important here is that we were part of a larger coalition of people who were not just writing letters, but were also protesting, right? We're also visiting representatives. And so there was a multi-pronged effort, right? That the, the letter writing campaign was only part of. So I don't wanna give you the impression that letter writing by itself will necessarily accomplish anything. So what, what I want to do today right, is to give you the basic tools, right, to make your own decisions about uh, what issues you want to target, what scale the issues are at, who you, whose attention you're trying to get, and what you want them to do. Because all of those things uh, are, uh, are things that you need to know about the context of the letter, and they determine the content of your letter, actually. So that's the reason why the letter to the editor turned out uh, to be useful, right? And before I show you the, the letter, a sample of the letter itself to show you what you, you must do in this kind of letter, I wanna also explain that we had a big group, right? So we assembled, right? Because in part we were working with this much larger uh, immigrant rights group, we wound up getting about 60 people involved uh, and you know, over a course of two years. Uh, and the idea was that no one person was writing uh, a letter, uh, you know, any more than once every six weeks, right? So the idea was that the individual demand was low, but the collective action, right, was that newspapers and other outlets were getting bombarded week after week for 96 weeks. That's how long the campaign took, a little under two years. Uh, they were getting bombarded, right, from different angles about different aspects of this problem, but all with the same demand. Uh, right, and, and with the same set of goals. 
uh, and trying to attract the attention of the same people, in this case, the county commissioners. Uh, and so that's why it worked, right? Because individually, I only had to write 200 words every six weeks. That's what everybody did. But there were a lot of us, right? And we worked in teams and the teams rotated. So, you know, team one wrote the first week and so on and so forth. So this was a very specific use of the letter to the editor uh, that did not depend on the individual because of course, like if your kids got sick or you were too busy one week, everybody took up the slack. There were still nine other people or seven other people, you know, uh, doing the writing. So it didn't, it didn't depend on you doing it all the time either. So, so part of the question here is, right, how are you going to assemble uh, you know, a, a, a kind of critical mass of writers who are dedicated to doing this kind of targeted writing, um, you know, over a relatively long period of time. But also keep in mind that, uh, that in the end, right, we, we didn't keep doing this forever. The group finally came to a decision, right, that we had, uh, the, the campaign had done what it was designed to do. An independent committee was actually uh, appointed and nobody wanted to hear from us in terms of the letter to the editor anymore. The newspaper stopped publishing us, right? And so we stopped. So, so there was a beginning, a middle and an end to this, uh, right? It was a group effort and it was strategic and it was local, right? So, so that is the context in which uh, the letter to the editor turned out to be a useful form of public writing. And so uh, I would be happy to take questions about that after the breakout rooms. But what I really want you to do is to begin the discussion in the breakout rooms, right, about uh, what your goals are, who you want to work with, like what, what you want to target, right, and how you, you will know when you're done, right? So I really want us to have enough time in those small groups to start brainstorming, right, about how you can use this particular form. Uh, and before we do that, I'm just going to very briefly go over the second letter that is in the handout that I believe you already were sent by Amy. So I'm gonna share this one now. So you can, you can see the, the individual parts. So by the way, um, the one above, the young people understand water and climate crises. To be honest, that was a kind of one-off you know, where I wanted to raise this issue, I had already gotten used to the form and it was published, right? But it wasn't part of this larger effort, right? And, uh, you know, and it didn't really do very much, but the second one, right, was part of the group effort that did accomplish one of our goals. So here we are. Um, and I will note that in newspapers, we targeted, by the way, everybody sent their letters to, uh, to a local newspaper, in my case, a town newspaper, and to a state newspaper. So, you know, so we tried to target different levels. And I just want to point out that uh, you are not in control of the title of your letter if it gets published, but in your subject line, you can actually suggest the title that you want. And so Pain in the Ice was um, was my obnoxious little title suggestion. And it worked because Donald Payne is my congressional representative and the letter was about him and targeted at him, right? So, so you'll see this basic structure here, right? Of what is the problem? The problem is that Representative Payne has not talked about immigrant rights uh, uh, recently, right? So I was, it was a kind of calling him out on this issue. And then I pointed out, you know, what is the background of the problem in this particular case? That, that Representative Payne, who is a Democrat, was very good at blaming the Trump administration uh, for, uh, you know, for the problems at the border with children in cages and so on, right? But he could actually affect, the, you know, the, uh, the conditions of ICE detainees in the Essex County Jail in Newark, which is his hometown, uh, which is where his offices are, but he wasn't doing it even though he had this kind of very high flown uh, rhetoric about the connection between uh, immigrants' rights and, uh, and the struggle for African-American liberation, right? So I pointed that out, uh, you know, so there's, there's the, in this case, the technical information that's useful is the historical background and the personal background with this representative Right. So then I say, then I pivot 
right, in the next paragraph and say, uh, you know, it's easy to criticize Trump, but it's harder uh, to clean up your own backyard. Uh, and, you know, and here's what I want you to do, right? You've condemned ICE as recently, you know, as February of the year the letter was published, and now you need to actually do more, right? So, uh, so the last, uh, the last paragraph, which you see is very brief, is the demand, right? So, uh, you know, I wanted the representative uh, to separate himself from ICE, to stop supporting ICE, right, and to to do something material and concrete for the welfare of ICE detainees. Right. So, so again, I was not expecting that he was going to read this, but I was expecting that his staff was going to read it. And indeed, through back channels, we found out that um, that Representative Payne was monitoring this campaign pretty closely. And he did finally not not to me directly. Right. But he did finally respond to the issue in public. Right. So the thing about this, um, this form is that like a sonnet, it's extremely strict, right? If you've ever written a sonnet, you're like 14 lines. Ugh. In this case, the word limit for the newspaper, and you have to check who, you know, about the word limit. Sometimes it's 200 words, sometimes it's 250, sometimes there is no limit. But in this case, I was targeting a newspaper that had a strict 200 word limit. And if you, if you sent in a letter that was 202 words, they would just trash it. Right. So newspapers are super, super strict about word limitations. So the, the letter had to be as brief as it is. Right. So that is extremely painful for me. I actually had a hard time writing letters at first that were this short, but I learned. Right. And so what you can see here is that there, there are a variety of nested issues in terms of uh, using a letter to the editor campaign. Um, some of them are generic, right, in terms of the genre of the letter to the editor. You have to figure out how to write one, what the parts are, what has to be there, what doesn't have to be there. You have to figure out how to do it concisely if you're targeting a newspaper that has, um, that has a very strict word limit. Uh, and then you, you need to, uh, at least in my experience, if you want to make this effective, you need to ally yourself with a group of uh, friends and, and coworkers, right? Perhaps with an already existing uh, activist group and perhaps not. Uh, but in any case, you have to get with a group, develop a plan, follow it systematically, right? Monitor the results, uh, shift your strategy if, if you're not getting the results that you want. And then finally, uh, you know, figure out whether or not your strategy has worked, like have you attained the goal and is the letter writing campaign going to continue or are you going to, going to move on to another strategy, right? So there's a lot to talk about here and I recognize that. Um, so I'm gonna unshare this uh, and I am going to put in the chat, I hope it's not too long for the chat, we'll see. Nope, there we go, I'm gonna put in the chat what I would like you to talk about in your breakout rooms, which is um, what problem or issue do you want to target? Whose attention are you trying to get? What is the goal? Who are your allies? Uh, how can you begin to organize, right? So there's a lot there. We're gonna give you about 15 minutes. Uh, and of course, uh, in breakout rooms, it's always important as I tell my students, right? Have somebody, at least one person doing the recording so that you can report out if you need to uh, at the end and so that you have a record of what you've talked about and so that you have a record of what questions you have, right? So, um, so having said all of that, I, I now would like us to begin our breakout room discussion and I look forward to our larger group discussion uh, you know, after the breakout rooms are over. So see you all on the flip side. And um, can I get you to repeat the questions in the chat? Um, they're not visible to all participants. Um, oh, is it because, uh, let me share them then. Okay. And maybe um, I'm sorry, Laura, say again. Yeah, if you can share them and maybe participants can take a screenshot. Um, sure, so here, can everybody see them now? You should see uh, a screen that says breakout discussion brainstorming. Yes, if you would just leave them there for a moment, I'll um, copy them. 
Sure, and while you're doing that, I'll repeat them. So sure. question one, what problem or issue do you want to target? Question two, whose attention are you trying to get? Three, what is the goal? Four, who are your allies? And five, how can you begin to organize? And I'll just leave that up, right, until the breakout rooms are active. Great, they're in the chat as well. So if it's helpful to grab them from the chat, um, participant can, participants can do that. Um, Amy is assigning breakout rooms and so you should get an invitation shortly. Welcome back everyone, thank you. Thumbs up, good discussion. Thank you. I'm always glad for the folks who are ready to give a thumbs up. Um, <laughs> we will, <laughs> yay. Um, uh, you can use your reaction button to encourage each other, applaud, um, as well as to raise your hand. Um, so I won't be able to see both screens, um, but I will toggle between them. So be patient with me. I'll, I'll look for questions. Um, and I'll uh, have you also put questions in the chat. So um, Ant, would you like to start us off with a, with a question or a prompt for feedback? Sure. Well, um, I, I think that it would be helpful to me and perhaps helpful to others um, to hear a little bit about uh, what people, like which issues people are interested in targeting, you know, wh why they are interested in, a, in, in using the letter for the editor and what they're trying to accomplish with it as a form. So I, I'm just curious, like what sort of issues people uh, want to address. Yeah, let's take a moment and maybe some of you could type in the chat an issue um, that you or your group wanted to address and we'll scroll through some of those ideas and then I'll call on some of you to speak further. Great, minimizing food waste on our college campus, protecting a local river system. Others of you. Snow removal, <laughs> terrible. Um, mobility uh, and accessibility in environmental and especially um, sort of the extreme environmental shifts we have. Others of you. Laura, would you mind if I address the first one first? Yes, by all means. So the, um, the minimizing food waste on campus caught my attention in part because um, this is exactly the kind of local context where a letter to the editor can have a, a really solid impact, right? But the, so in other words, if you have a campus newspaper uh, or maybe several campus newspapers, right? Sending this kind of letter to them, right? Which would obviously target both the student body, but especially the administration and the staff. Uh, that could be really effective in and of itself. In fact, more effective than, than in another larger context because the, you know, the context of the school is so specific. But the other thing that, the reason that I wanted to address this in particular is that I forgot to mention how important it is that once you get the letter published, that you push it on social media, right? So this is a great example of a kind of audience or a system of audiences where, um, where it might be bad enough to, from the administration's perspective um, that people are drawing attention to this problem on campus. But in my experience in my own school, students have really gotten traction with the administration once they've started to uh, like post to Instagram and to tweet, right? Like to use all of their, their social media powers to attract larger attention, like using the letter to the editor as a base, right? So in other words, 
they they get it published in the newspaper in order to boost it on social media and that really gets the issue going and makes it harder uh, to ignore in the context of a school because then the alumni get involved and the trustees start to notice right so um, so this is a case and a context where the letter to the editor can be especially effective um, in this particular context if you boost it on social media so don't forget to do that Great, and I appreciate that point. Um, that was a project of an activism course I taught, um, and and they also got traction by doing exactly that, um, amplifying on uh, social media about res uh, responsibly, more responsibly sourced food um, and reducing food waste. We have two questions that I think share an interest in um, sort of the the. Uh, framing of a message, um, one in a political context where um, sort of shaming around an issue produces um, maybe a, a pushback um, and about um, the tone. And then a second question uh, about um, sort of uh, uh, thinking about community building um, uh, in a way that would be resonant with, with diverse participants in a community. And then we've got a couple more queued up. Okay, so those those were questions rather than comments, right? Like, in other words, I am uh, yeah. meant to respond. Okay. Yeah. So, and in, in particular, the person has referenced a, um, a context in Texas where shaming um, can produce a backlash rather than an endorsement, um, and maybe how to think about the framing in in those kind of contexts. So, I, I appreciate that question because, um, in fact, the the tone of uh, you know, of scolding that I used with my own representative, right? It, it, like, you're absolutely right. It's not appropriate all the time. And, and in general, like I just, as a matter of fact, um, the, the groups that I worked with really didn't use shaming, right, or scolding as a strategy most of the time. Um, so the tone, like one of the things that you could do, right, is begin with a more neutral or a more respectful, tone, right? Perhaps you might think of it as a more professional tone if you are targeting politicians, um, you know, and, and so things like ResistBot, I don't know whether you all know that app, but ResistBot wants you to be respectful in that way, right? To take a kind of civic-minded tone, right? So you could definitely begin that way and see what happens and then move out into more strident tones, perhaps, uh, you know, if, if that proves useful or if the civic minded respectful tone doesn't seem to be uh, to be getting anywhere, right? So I, I think that tone is really important and that it would probably be best not to begin, right, with a scolding tone or a strident tone. Although, of course, you, given the individual local context, you have to make that decision for yourself. But it's certainly true that the letter to the editor uh, as a genre assumes a kind of more respectful uh, restrained tone, right? So, and in terms of um, of community building, Laura, could you? I'm I'm a little uh, I'm I'm wondering what exactly the question about community building is. Like, how do you get other stakeholders into the conversation or into the project? Like, what? Yeah, do, thank you. Let me give you some more details. What, um, so that's the second question. We are interested in what kinds of message faith-based organizations in the Washington DC region could pose to the Washington Post, and I assume other outlets maybe as well, about the moral dimension of climate action. So thinking about tapping into a community as well as sort of having resonance with another community as the previous question suggested. Well, I think that in this, thank you. Um, I think that in, in this context of the letter to the editor, right, because um, civic discourse is a kind of secular religious discourse already, in, at least in the, the United States context, um, you know, we, we could have a discussion about how that plays out in other cultures around the world, but certainly in the US, right, uh, making a faith-based argument in a letter to the editor that is directed to particular officials in Washington, I think could potentially be a very effective mode of address, right? Because I think that when you're talking about moral issues, right, the, the, the kind of religious aspects uh, of the problem, right, or a religious way of addressing the problem can definitely be one way of making uh, the, the morality of the, the problem rise to the surface. 
Uh, and in, in that sense, I would also note that we have seen a resurgence in the, in the last five years, right, under the Trump administration, right, of, of the religious left, right? There's much more leftist progressive religious discourse now than there was even five years ago. Uh, and so, you know, that mode, I think, can be very, uh, very useful. So I would encourage you to pursue it and then see what happens. Thank you very much. Um, there are a couple of others um, and from different contexts. So I'll just suggest that there's some around water issues, um, complex issues related to flooding, um, to uh, wastewater management. Um, and of course those waterways flow through multiple um, locales. I wonder if you have any suggestions um, for those writers who are interested in, in water issues that may affect multiple municipalities or regions. And these are questions that look like they're coming from both US context as well as abroad. Well, I would, so I think that's a great question. And I would, I would just point out uh, that in my own experience, uh, there are locally speaking and nationally speaking, there are a number of different activist groups that have organized this kind of campaign or something like it uh, around watersheds, right? And so uh, in, in New Jersey, and I, I think throughout the Northeast, there's a, a vibrant, and, and the, the Philadelphia uh, folks might wanna chime in on this too, uh, because I know that there's a Delaware river keeper. I just wanted to point out the river keeper movement, right, has organized this kind of um, this kind of campaign in a number of different locations. So like I'm familiar in the New Jersey context with the Raritan river keeper movement, right? And that would be a great base to start. Like in other words, if you wanted to ally yourselves with a local river keeper or another local water group, right? That could be a great place right, of finding the number of people that you need to really have a campaign that lasts for better. So I do think that we should think in terms of watersheds and in terms of watershed protector movements. Uh, and, you know, and depending on where you are, I can imagine that that might, uh, that might involve uh, both uh, people like who are in, uh, in a more rural context, also people who are in a city context, um, you know, and certainly um, tribal nations as well, obviously, um, you know, and, and indigenous activist groups. So I think that organizing around, uh, you know, issues of river keeping, uh, you know, and and water pollution and flooding due to climate change, right? Like they, I think that they almost have a built-in set of activist groups who, who might want to ally with you, right? If you don't already have your own group. That's fantastic. And, and so I would imagine looking at activism around one particular watershed might be informative if there's not already an organized group um, to tap into for some insights for someone organizing themselves um, activism. This one has to do with um, uh, what's under the ground, how to act against fracking. And this is coming um, from uh, Pennsylvania. Fracked hydrocarbon production continues to rise um, and interested in um, asserting some pressure um, so that that is um, addressed within a within a state context. Right. So, so I think that the fracking situation in Pennsylvania um, it, it is a perfect example of the scale at which this kind of action can be effective. But I would, but what I would do honestly is I would begin at a more local level than the state. Right, I would begin at a town or a county level, right, and try to target a particular issue that is smaller than fracking itself to make it more local and more specific and more personal. Because one of the things about the letter to the editor is that if you have enough room, like if you have 500 words rather than 200 words, um, it's always a great strategy to tell a personal anecdote, right, or to make the issue personal and to make it per local by making it personal so that you are, you know, you're saying like, I always write from my town. I always identify myself as from Montclair, right? So that people know who I'm voting for, 
right? Like, and, and, uh, and geographically where I am and who my allies are. Uh, and so, you know, if you could start by targeting a fracking issue in your town, right, or in your county, and maybe get a bunch of towns together, right, or like are people who are local but still kind of distributed, right, then you can really make a difference precisely by speaking as a local group. And then if, if that campaign is successful, then you can build, right, alliances with other local groups to become a regional effort. And then you can begin to start targeting the state, right? So I think that a lot of this is kind of uh, about, uh, you know, learning to do it in a local setting as so many other things are, right? Learning to do it in a more limited local setting, using a personal voice, speaking, you know, as a person who lives in a place, speaking to other people in that place, and then see how far you can scale it up. That um, segues into an earlier question. How do you decide when it's better to use a letter to the editor versus an op-ed? And I'll take one more question after that and then invite those of you who'd like to stay. Um, we'll continue posing the questions to Ant. But again, this one is about the difference and making a decision between a letter to the editor and an op-ed. So uh, that's a great question and I have a very direct answer. The op-ed is a form right, that uh, where the, the writer takes the position of an expert on the issue, right, giving advice to non-experts. So the difference between an, a letter to the editor uh, and in terms of tone and positionality, right, versus the op-ed, right, is the op-ed is like, you know, uh, I'm a chemical engineer writing about hydrofracking because I live in Pennsylvania, right? And here is what you need to know from my technical knowledge about what hydrofracking does to a watershed, right? That's what you use op-eds to do. Letters to the editor do not require you to be an expert, right? They require you to have an argument that makes sense, right? Um, and to speak with a voice that is compelling. And so in that sense, right, it's much easier to write a letter to the editor and to get a group of people to write letters to the editor over and over again than, than, to, get, than to consistently get op-eds published. <clears throat> right, because you're limited by your expertise when um, when you are writing op-eds. It's a fantastic and helpful. The next question is how to get letters in local publications that have been taken over by very conservative ownership groups. Wow, um, that that can be a problem, <laughs> right? So. Um, I mean, what I would say then is that you you then have to do a kind of rhetorical ac acrobatic trick and figure out what sort of concern you have in common, right, with the editorial board, right? And that means that you have to read the, the, the letters to the editor for that newspaper. You should read the op-eds, right? So you should, you should really study up, right, on what, uh, what that newspaper and its op-ed board are interested in. Uh, you know, what kind of things its editors will or will not publish, the kind of tone that they expect um, uh, letters to have, right, by, by studying examples of published letters. And then you just need to be canny, right, to make your point in a way that will appeal to that audience, right, uh, in the required tone, right? So that's actually a much bigger ask. It's way more difficult to do that. So one of the things that you might do right, is start out with an easier task and target uh, a newspaper or other outlet um, that is more sympathetic to your political angle and try to get started that way, right, and then try to move on to the more difficult case, right, which requires some rhetorical razzmatazz. Um, but it certainly can be done. I mean, my group did it. Um, you know, the, we, have, we have a number of fairly conservative uh, newspapers in North Jersey, but like you have to, I'll give you an example of what worked, right? When we targeted one of the more conservative newspapers about the immigration issue, we used rhetoric about freedom and American liberty, right? And human rights, right? And the kind of language that resonated right, with people who are interested, um, not necessarily in quote unquote social justice, right, but in human rights and maximizing freedom, right, because one of the cases in the ICE jail, right, that we had 
one of the things that we talked about all the time, right, was that the people who ICE was detaining there were not criminals and they had done nothing wrong and that should offend conservatives as well, right? So like, it's sometimes hard to find common rhetorical ground, but you can find it. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've gotten most of the questions that were posed in the chat and we've reached the two o'clock period, our time mark. So I'll let those of you who need to go on to a next commitment um, to sign off. Um, Ant is willing to stay and take questions and have conversations. So if you'd like to talk through something with him, please do. Um, and again, uh, very, very grateful to have so much participation in these two sessions that we've done. Look forward to more public programming for us, from us uh, through um, the next few months and into the summer as well with a virtual conference. So thank you for coming today. And if you'd like to stay and speak with Ant, um, we're, we welcome you to just uh, stay here uh, and, and ask him questions next. Thanks everybody. And Amy, I think we can stop the recording now and just have a casual conversation next.